Thanks for the introduction, and yes, it's indeed very nice to be back visiting Kerala College uh, after several years of COVID. So thanks for the opportunity. Uh, okay, so um, uh, so today I'm going to be talking about some joint work with my colleague Rob Kehotsky and Mark Graham, who was a PhD student with us. Okay, good. So I'll start with the brief of uh, so I'll start by describing the problem and give a partial overview of related work uh, before going on to uh, describe the two main algorithms we are going to look at uh, and then present some of our main results and two techniques. Okay, so here's the problem. We have N agents and uh, for now N is fixed, but eventually we are going to let it go to infinity. Uh, and then each of them has one packet to transmit or one message of a fixed length. Uh, and uh, they are communicating over some graph. And the model is of broadcast, not point to point links, but broadcast. So when one node sends a message, all its neighbors in the graph hear it simultaneously in that time slot. Yeah, and time is discrete. Uh, and we think of a time slot as being long enough to transmit one message, one packet. Uh, and we are also going to assume that every broadcast is heard by your neighbors perfectly with no errors. Uh, and everybody can transmit simultaneously and hear others simultaneously. So if you're familiar with the contention resolution problem, then we are abstracting out that part of the problem and only thinking of uh, the scheduling problem. So this, if this graph were, okay, so what's the uh, objective? And the objective is all agents must receive all packets. If your graph is complete, this is trivial. In one time slot, everybody hears it, uh, but it's not. And so the goal is how should you schedule retransmissions so that everybody gets every message. Uh, and, um, 
in a sense, there is no randomness here. So this there is a deterministic algorithm for doing this, but we are not necessarily looking at uh, so agents are simultaneously broadcasting. Agents can simultaneously broadcast. Yeah, yeah. There are no collisions. No. There's no collisions. Yeah, yeah. And I, I should also say, please feel free to interrupt if you have questions. Yeah. Yeah, so there are no collisions, uh, that there are no errors, so everything is error free. Uh, so we are kind of assuming that all those problems are dealt with at some other layer in the protocol stack. And so here everything is error free. Um, so that there need not be probability, but we may be considering randomized algorithms, and so probability might come in. Uh, and uh, yes, and so we don't. Uh, we are willing to accept probabilistic guarantees that the algorithm, so you give me a value, 90% or 99% or whatever, I should come up with an algorithm which guarantees that all agents receive all packets with that specified probability. Okay, and we want this to happen quickly. Uh, we want simple algorithms and we want the agents to be able to function in a distributed way. There's not one plus one agent who's telling them all what to do. So that's the goal. Uh, and so I'll uh, talk a bit about some related work. So there have been two kinds of uh, algorithms that have been looked at in the literature. One is called the broadcasting problem. And here there's just a single mode that has a message and this has to get to everybody. Uh, and the other is what we just described, and that in the literature is called the gossiping problem, where everybody has one message. Okay, and uh, what else? So the messages are all of uh, fixed size, so we can take it to be in its size. Uh, and uh, so in the original problem, uh, they do look at the contention resolution part as well. So if a message is, uh, the message is received correctly only if exactly one neighbor is transmitting, I will make a comment on that. We ignored this part, but originally they look at this as well. Uh, and they pose another condition which we are going to relax later on, which is that each in each time slot, the message you broadcast should only be from the initial set. You cannot make up new messages. Okay. So you have to only, you, you can uh, broadcast only your own message or something you've heard in the past. You cannot do other things. Uh, but we'll relax that. Uh, okay, so What's the problem? So, no, sorry, that was the wrong way. Yeah. Okay. The, and the objective, the objective is to find a schedule that minimizes the latency till all nodes receive uh, all packets. And uh, unfortunately, it was shown even for the easier version of the problem. The broadcasting problem is at NB hard, and this was shown in 85. Uh, and so that motivated research, then if you can't solve this uh, uh, latency minimization problem exactly, then can you approximate it well? And maybe if you can't solve it on general graphs, are there specific families of graphs on which there are good algorithms for solving? And those are the questions you can ask. So it's not just that everybody keeps on broadcasting. You have a lot of messages come to you, then you decide which is the right one to send. Exactly. That's, yeah. that, that's the issue. Yeah. 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 And then who's, is it kind of centralized decision making or? Uh, ideally, you want decentralized decision making. But you could also, you could even ask the centralized okay. right. problem. So, first, for the centralized problem, is there a good algorithm? And already that was shown that it's NP hard. So, even as a centralized problem, you can't solve it exactly. Right. And then if you just follow some greedy policy, you know, whatever comes to you, some kind of first come, first serve, just keep on throwing it away in one give out guarantees. I don't know about guarantees for the greedy policy. For general graphs, it's probably bad. I said. Okay. 
Okay, so what's been done for this problem? So, Baryehuda, uh, Goldreich, and Itai gave an approximation algorithm, uh, which is pretty good. So, they, they got an algorithm which is a uh, randomized algorithm, which is within a log n factor of 40. So, so, the number of rounds it takes is at most log n times the best that any algorithm can do. And they also show that you do need randomization, that uh, there are graphs on which any deterministic algorithm will take a factor of n longer than the best algorithm. And it's the number of vertices in the graph. Yeah. yeah, and this logarithmic penalty comes from contention resolution. So if you uh, ignore the contention resolution part of that, then which we do, then this, this is a effectively a constant factor approximation algorithm. So all the results that I state now, if you want to. Sorry, can I ask a question? I'm online. Yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, so uh, why isn't the broadcast problem? Why can't they just um, broadcast along the shortest path tree rooted at the source? So, so that's what, uh, so the algorithm of Baryehuda et al constructs a multi, yeah, constructs a tree along which the broadcast happens exactly. No, so uh, why why is that not optimal? I mean, uh, because you also have to solve contention resolution. Uh, oh, there are capacities on the edges. Uh, there are no no. There, uh, no if the, the if there is one message to be transmitted from one source to everybody, um, then we take the shortest path tree rooted at that node. And we just keep sending it uh, down the tree. Uh, why doesn't that work? Um, so, so you you need randomization to do the contention resolution still, because um, okay, so. So, uh, so if two neighbor, if two of my neighbors broadcast at the same time, I receive nothing. So uh -huh. I, I see. Which of them is okay. okay. I see. Okay, got it. I mean, so yeah, so you cannot uh, restrict. Um, yeah, so neighbors who are not on the tree also receive your message. Yeah, exactly. I see. I see. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. So if there is no contention res resolution, this algorithm, yes, would be optimal, like you like you said. Yeah. Yeah. The contention resolution gives the log n factor from optimality. And similarly, for the results, I'm going to say so we are ignoring the contention resolution part of the problem. So if you put that in, you have to inflate all our results that I report today by an additional factor of log n to deal with the contention resolution. And that's that can be done. Okay, and so similarly, they also then extended this to the gossiping problem. And again, this depends on building a uh, uh, building some tree over which uh, you're going to the Got the gossiping. Uh, and again, they showed optimality within some polylog factor of, uh, of this algorithm. Okay, and so this is for general graphs. Uh, and then uh, there's been a lot of other work on this problem for, uh, and so here uh, for both for known networks and for specific models. So uh, I now don't remember which of these did what, but many of these were for random geometric graphs, some were for general graphs, uh, but there's been a huge body of work on various approximation algorithms for specific graphs. And for some things like, uh, and for some graphs, there are also constant factor approximation algorithms rather than polylog. Uh, and many of these indeed as, as the question mentioned rely on building some kind of a tree, say a breadth or a search tree. 
and this incurs a one-time cost, uh, and then uh, it can be done in a decentralized way, and then you incur this one-time cost, and then you solve the problem. Okay, so this is uh, one uh, approach which is mainly within the computer science community. And then there has also been, uh, there have been other approaches to this problem, more in the EE community. Uh, and this work has more often been on point to point rather than broadcast links. Uh, and many of them uh, use, uh, okay, so they, some of them uh, use a choice of uh, uh, who transmits and some use network coding. There's a mix of those. Uh, and these works have looked uh, and uh, the focus has been less on latency and more on capacity region. So there is not just one packet to transmit per user, but there is a stream of packets. And then you want to ask what's the, what sort of uh, rates can this support, can these algorithms support. Uh, and these algorithms have tended to be more lightweight and not require constructing trees. And we are, I'm going to propose a couple of algorithms which are more in the spirit of these. There will be no trees constructed, uh, but they are for a specific graph model. They are not for general graphs. They are for an extremely simple graph model, uh, which I'll now introduce. So what we are going to consider uh, is only at a shreddy random graphs. So a graph has n vertices uh, and every edge uh, is present, every directed edge is present with probability P independent of all others. Okay, that's our model. Uh, and the presence of an edge says that, uh, as I already said, that if node I broadcasts and J, I, I, J is an edge, then J receives this message correctly. And if uh, the edge is absent, then nothing is received. Okay, so. That's the model. Okay, and we are going to look at asymptotics as the number of agents goes to infinity, but P is fixed. So this becomes a dense efficient graph. Uh, and in this regime, uh, the diameter of this graph is two. So P is not one, so it's not the complete graph. But uh, for any fixed P, however small, if you let it go to infinity, there are two hot paths between every source and destination. And that greatly simplifies uh, the algorithms and it simplifies the analysis more importantly. So one of the open problems is going to be to extend these results to sparse graphs where that's not true. Okay, so that's the model. So maybe I'll just pause briefly to check if there are any questions about the model of the problems to the net. Then the graph will have uh, two length parts to Yeah, so you can ask, okay, so let's fix two nodes and ask, is there a path via a fixed vertex? So that's P squared. And then there's a huge number of choices of which vertex you go through. Right. So that's exponentially small probability and you can bound over it. Things. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. So this. Uh, okay. So the objective is the same. Uh, to find simple decentralized algorithms. Okay, and there are two. So when we started looking at this problem, we were very loosely motivated by uh, vehicular networks. And this is maybe not a good model for vehicular networks for all sorts of reasons. That there is a strong spatial element which we are ignoring. Um, uh, and it would be sparse, and then it's not going to infinity, but nevertheless, that okay. So it's a, it's a challenging problem, and this was the, a simple model that we wanted to start with. Uh, and then you could, uh, from the application point of view, you don't, maybe this is not a static graph, but a graph evolving over time. Uh, 
So that's what ideally you want to model, but we can look at two extreme uh, extremes. So one is the annealed or phosphating regime. Here, the network is evolving so fast that between successive broadcasts, you can think of it as being resampled. At each time step, you have a different network. Uh, the other is the quenched or slow fading regime. So here we assume the network is fixed once and for all. Uh, and this is the model we are going to look at in this talk. And intuitively, we think this is what makes it harder for gossip to spread. Uh, and simulations support that intuition. We don't have a proof for it. What do you want to add the nodes? Mm -hmm. So you are looking at quenched uh, regime, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, nodes know which, where are the edges between which nodes? Uh, we don't even assume they know that. You could think of them knowing, but we don't uh, take that. We don't assume they know that. Oh, uh, yeah, and we and we think this is the worst case for gossip. Okay. Okay. So questions. Oh. So we are going to look at two extremely simple algorithms. So one is random delay. So we don't know the graph. So in the first time step, by everybody broadcasts their message. So their neighbors in the graph get the message. In, in all subsequent time steps, I'm going to pick a random message I've heard so far and broadcast it. Either heard so far or heard in the first round. There will be a slight distinction. Uh, and broadcasters. And the other approach is going to be a random linear network coding. And if you haven't seen network coding, don't worry, I'll explain it. So the message cannot have information how many nodes it's visited so far? No, you can, but we, we uh, uh, no, it, let's say it's not thing in practice, right? Yeah. And well, so what we are going to show is that with random linear network coding, we are already optimal, so we don't have to do anything else. The first method is not optimal. Okay, so how well do these things do? So, so, sorry, I, uh, yeah, so I still have a question. Uh, so is the problem that there is one piece of information at a particular node and everybody needs to know it? Or this is a like a continuous thing where some throughput is to be established. That is, information is arriving at one node, and uh, continuously it needs to be transmits is transmitted and scheduled. Yeah. So let's, uh, I, for concreteness, think of it as there being just one packet per node. Yes. Uh, and that's all. That's all the information that has to be sent. And the, okay, in, in practice, there is a continuous stream. I, oh, depends on the application. Even, even in regular networks, you, there is a continuous stream. But because we want to focus on uh, low latency, if you're sending a packet from your car about your velocity, acceleration, et cetera, you, don't, you want it to get to all cars in the neighborhood within tens of milliseconds. And you don't want to... Uh, uh, gain rate by bunching together large numbers of packets and sending it a minute later when it's useless. Uh, so in the broadcast problem, there will be only one source, right? Or... No, we are looking at the gossiping problem. So in the gossiping problem, okay. yeah. So every every node has its own message. So with n nodes, there are n messages. Okay, got it. Thank you. So you say random linear combination, the combination, I mean, the coefficient are all the same. The coefficients are sent. Yeah, the coefficients are sent. Indeed. I mean, that. Yeah. yeah. So what was the question? That was for the random linear network coding. I'll come, come to that later and I'll explain the idea of that point. Okay, so for the random relaying, let's just. Uh, do the heuristic analysis. So uh, how many rounds do, you, do we think random relay should take? Uh, so the 
degrees of hormones, in a, you have to look at both in and out degrees. They all are close to NP. Uh, so in the first round, you, so, okay. So in each round, you receive NP distinct packets. Uh, and so if these were randomly chosen from all packets, uh, then you're not cleverly deciding which packets to send. You're just randomly sending something. So you, you think everybody needs to get n log n packets in order to get n distinct packets. So that's the coupon collector. Uh, so you get NP per round. So you think uh, we should need n log n uh, divided by NP. So you need about log n over P rounds. That's, that's what you heuristically expect, right? Uh, you need, in fact, a bit more. Uh, you want the probability. So the, the typical node in log n over p downs, a typical node would have got enough packets, but not all n nodes would have got enough packets. So you need to look at tail bounds of that, etc. So if you do that, you, in fact, need two log n uh, over p downs. That's what you need so you have to look at tail bounds of coupon collector and do that and you can make all this rigorous the heuristic can be made rigorous so it's pretty much what you expect you know you need to log in for p rounds uh, and we were able to prove this for the version of the algorithm in which you only take first round packets and choose you, you rebroadcast packets you've heard in the first round, but not in subsequent rounds. Uh, and if you do that, the analysis is easier. We were able to get the right bound. Uh, if you take the more reasonable algorithm where you choose uniformly at random from all received packets, the best we were able to prove is 2 log n over p squared. Though simulation suggests that 2 log n over p works as well for this algorithm, and you should think it should work. It's just that we could not uh, get as good an analysis from this version. You can't make the analysis go through if p is going to zero at the end. Then it's, it gives a very poor bond, indeed. But it does work. Uh, this. Yeah, but it does take a large number it of bounds. Large. Relaying, random relaying is not fast. Two log n is an upper bound in the theorem, but the simulations show you do have this kind of scaling. So you don't, with random relaying, you don't do much better. So, yeah. Uh, and, and maybe, okay. So if P is small, your diameter is uh, also starts getting large. Oh, in this, okay, this asymptotic regime, it's still true, but uh, yeah, yeah, you, you need a number of rounds that does grow like this, let's say it's really small. Okay, uh, fine, I won't uh, go through the details of the proof, I think. So I'll just show the simulations for this. Yeah, so this is what you have. So we've plotted uh, the number of nodes n, uh, against the number of transmission time steps needed. We did it for a number of values of P. I'm just showing the plot for P equals R. So this is the two log n over P line, and it's pretty close to that. Uh, okay, and, and what we have done is uh, box in this curve plot. So you have the median here, the upper and lower quartile of the number of transmissions needed, and the whiskers show the full range in, I believe, a thousand simulations per scenario. So it's fairly well concentrated around the median value, but there is, as n goes to infinity, it's not shrinking, there is uh, non zero variability around that. So, one possible open question is can you get, uh, can you obtain? Uh, Final results about fluctuations. Can you prove the theorem of the sort that the number of rounds you need is two log n over p plus some limiting random variable or something like that? Or, or maybe you need scaling for that. Uh, yeah, so that's, a, that's an open question. 
uh, what else? Yeah, and this was for the version where you uh, don't just uh, sample from the first round packets, but from things you heard in subsequent rounds as well. The number of rounds you take is again the same as in the previous plot. It's about 20 to 45 is the range. 2 log n over p squared is the upper bound we prove. So the theoretical upper bound is very conservative for this. In fact, it shows the same 2 log n over p scaling as before. So I won't go through the proofs because there isn't a lot of time, but the proof for this is not hard. So you just look at, uh, uh, so, so you take a pair of uh, nodes and ask, does it get the message from this node get to that node uh, in this many rounds, get a new uh, proof, large deviation bounds on that, and then take the union bound over all the X. That's pretty much all there is to it. Okay, so now I'll go on to the more so interesting. Is union bound to use? You think you can do better than taking a mean character? Um, good question. I yeah, don't don't know for the so that the reason when you when you allow for uh, choosing not just from first round packets but all packets, it seems that. You, you may have to look not just at two hop paths, but longer paths. And that makes it messy. And then the union bond seems sloppy. And yeah, we are, the, we are not able to push that through. Okay, so now I'll give a very brief outline of network coding. So, uh, so consider this graph where A and B each have a message which they want to send to B and E. Uh, so A's message can be heard directly by D, B's message by E, and C has also got both these messages after the first round trade. Now, what has how many more rounds do you need to get these A's message to E and B's message to D? C could relay, so it could take one round to broadcast B's message for D and one more to broadcast A's message for it. So it looks like you need two more rounds, three in total. But in fact, you could just use one more round because what C could do now is take the XOR of A and B's messages and broadcast it. D has already got B's message, so it could recover B's by taking. The XOR and similarly A could recover, uh, E could recover this message. Okay, so it needs only one more round and not two more rounds. And that's that's basically the idea. So what uh, intermediate nodes in the network are going to do is that they are going to compute uh, random linear combinations over some finite field of the messages they have got and they are going to be broadcasted. So this is the idea. So first round, each node broadcasts its own packet, and in subsequent rounds, every node broadcasts a random linear combination of the packets that turn in the first round. Okay. And then, when are we done? We are done if every node can uh, recover all the packets for which it must be able to solve the system of linear equations it has received. Yeah. So you you. Compute a random linear combination, you, you, you have to transmit your coefficients as well. So that I can solve these simultaneous equations I've got and then recover the packets. Okay, so what, what we need is for the simultaneous equations defined by the received coefficient vectors to have to be decodable. Uh, yeah, and so this matrix should be put right. Now, if you could do all your arithmetic over the real number field, for example, then this would be trivial because uh, a typical n by n matrix is inverted or real numbers is inverted. If you draw the okay, if you draw the coefficient groups on continuous distribution, then it's inverted with the property one. So you can just solve it. But that would require very little precision arithmetic. 
So similarly, uh, if you pick your source, so, so the self coefficient, so it's not invertible, that's still uncountable. It's uncountable, but it has a measure sequence. Yeah. And it's also uh, the set where it's invertible is an open set. Okay. So it's generically it's invertible. Uh, yeah, so we are not going to work over a number of feet, we are going to work over a finite feet. Now, if you were to keep, uh, so then again, uh, uh, so you now we are going to ask a question. Uh, so think of a random matrix over a finite field. The rows are of length n. Uh, uh, yeah, so the rows in each time step, I give you uh, one row of this matrix, a row vector of length n. Uh, how many rows do I need until this matrix has full column? Right? If I send just n rows, I have an n by n matrix. Will it be full round? It might. With some probability, but that probability will no longer be one. If you make, if you keep, sorry, n fixed and make the field size q very big, then this probability will get close to one. So that's, but that's not the way we want to solve this. We are thinking of n being very large and q as being fixed. So we want a fairly small field, but the matrix is getting bigger. And is this random matrix, n by n matrix, going to be full round? Uh, and the answer will typically be no, but uh, okay, then how many more rows do we need to add to this matrix to make it full column? Right? That's the question we are asking. Okay, so that's uh, so this is the approach. Anyway, we'll get to that in a while. So the approach of uh, network coding is to do this sort of thing. With coefficients over some finite field. Um, and well, for our work today, the value of Q isn't going to matter too much. So, for concreteness, if you're not very familiar with finite fields, especially think of Q equals two. So, this is the binary field. Uh, yeah, so the uh, addition of the sex of this field. Okay. <coughs> Uh, so now let's look at the matrix of coefficients received by some particular agent. Uh, so in each round, uh, it receives. Uh, so what happens? So each row of the matrix corresponds to coefficients received from one neighbor. Okay, and each column corresponds to one agent. So here's an example. Uh, so this row says that. Uh, this, the agent from whom I heard took the linear combination of packet three, packet five, and packet six and transferred it. That's what this row is saying. Okay. And so uh, in each round, I get each of my neighbors gives me one row of this matrix. So I get about NP rows. And then the question is after how many rounds does this matrix? Um, full rank, full column rank. Okay. So to have full column rank, you need at least 10 rows. So you need at least one for P rounds. And the main result is that uh, this is pretty close to what we need. We need a little bit more than this, but not much more than this. Okay. So here's our algorithm uh, concretely. So what we do is uh, so in each round, the yeah, so so I said after the first round, nodes broadcast random linear combinations. And this is how they compute these random linear combinations. They are going to be sparse. So it uh, with this probability, uh, uh, with probability, so think of D in as N P, but we, we don't know N and P, whereas we observe this. So I'm not assuming you know anything at all about the graph. So these can be computed, but you might as well think of these as NP. So with probability about log n over n, uh, or one minus log n over n, you don't take uh, 
that the packet is not chosen. So the probability log n over n times beta, you choose the packet and assign it uh, coefficient one if your field size is two. Okay. So there are only about beta log n non zero coefficients per row. Uh, and you send that linear combination. Uh, and the, our main result is that uh, if beta is big enough, at least eight, then we mentioned already that you need at least one over p rounds. You can't possibly finish it fewer than this. If you allow two more rounds, then that's enough for all agents to be able to decode all the signals. That's the that's main result. It, meaning that with high probability, the matrix of coefficients they receive will be uh, in, will be full ramp for all. Uh, so, I'm going to say a little bit about the proof, not at all. Uh, so, this uh, adapt, so we adapted a proof from the work of uh, Plumer, Karp, and Wenzel. Uh, the main difference is uh, what they did was for uh, matrices with IID entries, IID random entries. For us, the entries are not IID because they are constrained by this communication graph. You can only put non-zero coefficients if you have a neighbor. If you don't have a neighbor, then you can't put the coefficient is supposed to be zero. Beyond that, it's IID, but that small change complicates the proof quite a lot, and that's what we did. <coughs> Okay, so the result was stated for beta bigger than eight. We think with more careful bounding, we can push it to beta bigger than two, but didn't do that. And maybe we can also squeeze one extra round off. Uh, and the results of uh, Bloomer et al. suggest that it can't, it's not even true for beta smaller than one. So between one and two, we don't. We think we can push it for two. We don't, our methods won't work between one and two. Sorry, what is the result uh, that card uh, so, so for IID entries, they show that uh, uh, that they, they give bounds on how many rows you need for the matrix to be full. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll first show some simulation results before just giving a few proofs. So here again, as a function of n, we have looked at the number of uh, rounds we need. Uh, so p is a half, so one over p plus two is four. So our theoretical result says that four rounds are enough. Um, <clears throat> if beta is bigger than eight, then four rounds are enough. Uh, for beta equals one, it looks like we do need more than four rounds. <clears throat> Again, these are box and whisker plots which have collapsed for n large enough. So everything and all all one thousand simulations it took exactly six rounds. <clears throat> uh, and then if beta equals two, that's already enough, except for very small n where where it took a bit more, uh, four rounds are enough. So, so you do see that for network coding, there is concentration of the number of rounds needed. Uh, and uh, it's uh, the theoretical bound. And uh, if beta is four, yeah, again, four rounds is enough. Now for small n, in fact, you can do a little bit better even. Okay, so that's some simulation results to show <coughs> that they seem to match even for beta equals two. <clears throat> okay, so now a bit about the proof. So uh, I just mentioned a couple of works on random matrices over finite fields. So if you have an n by n random matrix over JFQ, uh, non zero entries with probability. P and then you, they are uniformly chosen with the non-zero field elements. 
And then you want to ask what's the probability that this matrix is not singular. So for the dense case, this was first looked at by Moko Katyai, and uh, he showed that uh, there's some strictly positive probability uh, uniformly in N that this matrix is already not singular. So just the N by N matrix uh, has positive probability of being in vertical, but not one, not close to one, but pointed away from zero. And then this work of Blumacarp and Belson that I mentioned, they look at look at sparse matrices, uh, and they show that uh, your the rank of this matrix n by n matrix is not quite n, but it's only a little bit below n, uh, and the defect how much it falls below n has exponentially decreased takes. Uh, and they also show that if you add another log n rows to this matrix of ID entries, that's enough uh, to push this to full track. So they only need log n entries. So in our model, we are, and, and okay, and what multiple of log n you need depends on the field size too. So it does depend on the field size. The reason it doesn't depend for us is we are adding n rows rather than log n rows. In each round, we are adding an NP so that's huge. So the beam size just washes out. So, in effect, one round should be enough, but we have dependencies and we couldn't quite push it to one more round big enough. We need the two more. Does it also any You need log in by it. Yeah, you need. So, there's any smaller than this? If, if it's smaller than this, we don't know. Just if it's bigger than this, it's fine. Yeah. yeah, so that's why I said we, so at least from their result, it suggests that you need D type plus one. So half more than the end, we don't have one. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, so I think I already mentioned this. So the reason we can't just plug in their results is that our rows are not independent uh, because they are constrained by the communication graph. Um, right, okay. Okay, so what we look at so for our proof, we exploit some block structure that this matrix of received coefficients is going to have. So let me bunch together the rows I have received from a particular neighbor. Blocks that I received from distinct neighbors are independent of each other. And for blocks that I received from a particular neighbor, once I condition on the communication graph, they are mutually independent of each other. They are only correlated by the fact that they say no such and uh, where there is no neighbor, it's supposed to be zero. Okay, and then what are we going to do? So we want to, to show that eventually this matrix is full rank. We want to show that uh, its kernel is trivial. It only contains the zero vector. Uh, and the way we do that is we look at any non-zero vector and ask the question, is it in the kernel? Can I form the probability that is it, it's in the kernel? And I can do this for any fixed column vector. And the, the main point is that vector spaces over finite fields have only finitely many vectors. So I can actually do a union point here, which I can't do over a field number of fields. Okay, so given the time, I probably don't want to go through this. I think the structure of the proof is clear, right? So I pick a, I want to ask whether something's in the kernel. Uh, these blocks are independent. So for the, for it to be in the kernel, it should be in the kernel of each of these blocks. I calculate the probabilities in the kernel of this block, take it to the power k. Uh, that's it. And how do I calculate the probabilities in the kernel? It only depends on the number of non-zero elements in the vector. That's uh, that's how it works. So uh, that's that's the. 
Yeah, so I already mentioned. So you just take the product over blocks. Um, okay, and so that, that's a sketch of the proof of the main result. And so I'll just finish with some of the problems. So, uh, yeah, so we, we looked at uh, two uh, algorithms for the random relaying problem one where you only forward what you heard in the first round. And for that, we got good time bombs. And the one where you, you relay all previously heard packets for which we couldn't get good enough bombs, and uh, extending the analysis to that would be nice. Um, and then uh, the other question is can we more tightly, uh, can we say something quite tight about the number of rounds needed by the random? So the simulations suggest that what you need is this two log n over p plus an order of random relay. Can we actually prove a theorem of that now? That the fluctuations are some power control given by some limiting random radius. Okay, for practical applications that may be relevant, but it seems like a nice theoretical result to have. But from the practical point of view, the much more interesting question is, can we extend these results to sparse networks? And uh, for the relaying part, that seems more tractable. And I think we should be able to do that. Uh, for the coding part, uh, it gets tricky because we are really using the fact that uh, the diameter is two because if the diameter is bigger than two, it's not enough to uh, code over first round packets. You have to code over subsequent packets which are already extras. Now, this brings in huge amount of dependency. And pushing through proofs with that level of dependency, I don't know how we'll be able to do that. So that's a, that's a more challenging problem. That would be interesting. Um, yeah, and so that's still in the regime of sparse and the graphs, but then the more interesting problem for applications would also be to do things for random geometry graphs, for example. Uh, again, uh, that would be very different techniques. And what we have done would not directly extend to it, but that's an interesting problem. Okay, uh, and yeah, that's all I have to say. So I'll take questions. Any random broadcast from people uh, online uh, questions? I also hope I was uh, audible to the online participants. Sorry, I, my volume declined over time. So the question you're asking seems to be the next time this thing is the last time <laughs> at which everybody sees every time. So similar to the slow time, where you have to sum the delay between the generation time is zero. So all packets can be zero. When is it? Yeah. So for each packet, if I look at the time of the two, they save all the times and sum that. That would be the slow time you could have to this Okay. So I'm counting packet by packet. How long will it take for one packet to be seen by every single person? Is that objective for the system? Um, I think that's not so natural for this thing because things are happening in parallel. You don't really want to sound them, but you could ask what is typical. So is the tail being driven by a few atypical packets or not? And I think. Uh, okay, we haven't done this, but what I would say is for the relaying case, the typical packet would take half as long. You would need log n over p to, for the typical packet to be received by everybody. And the factor of two is from stragglers. And whereas in the uh, random coding case, in the first round, you get empty packets. After that, pretty much you decode all the remaining packets in the same time step. So there is no difference. Maybe at most one round. <coughs> we proved a bound of 1 over p plus 2. You need at least 1 over p, maybe 1 over p plus 1, maybe for the typical packet. 
So I, I would think that most one from the between the two become the best case. Freeze that I don't let it go to the Theoretically, no, but the simulation suggests that it's close to what the theory predicts. So the asymptotics kick in at medium sized and of about 100 or so. Well, approximation of the. Oh, for the approximation of the. The perfect step is to look at the other string graph. Big sign and big speed. And look at this graph. Can I say something about it? Which will tell me something. Uh, I'm not aware of good uh, deterministic algorithms that can, yeah, be these. All right, let's thank.